you need that curve number table, it's still on MU Online if you don't have it on your computer.
Let's all mute our computers.
let me interrupt you for just one second. Um, if you zip up all of the files in your directory, it's going to include the soil type data, which is quite big, and it could make your overall archive too large to upload to MU Online. So you see how there's this Sergo file. There's two of them that it got because uh, it got an adjacent soil file as well. So just highlight everything except for those Sergo files when you go to make your archive. So I'm excluding the zips that it downloaded. I'm also excluding the Sergo uh, folders where it unzi unzipped those. And so I right click, send to compressed zip folder. And so it's putting everything that I need to see except for those soil files in this zip that it created. And so then this WMS quiz compressed zip folder, it's only four megabytes. And I mean, that could be uploaded. It could be emailed. That's kind of a lot smaller than otherwise. If we had archived everything, uh, those soil files would kind of balloon it up. All right. Okay, so I've collected the papers of whoever's going to grade. And please make sure that you upload your zip files. Um, while you were working, I was as well. So you see the recorder is going, and uh, I demonstrated the solution on the video, as well as uh, the screenshots I think would be useful. Um, let me just quickly show you the answers. Um, it should be 170 CFS, approximately, for national streamflow statistics. And significantly less for that, uh, less than that for both TR55 and HEC1. Um, I don't think it'll take me very long to go through the entire thing. So let me do that. And at any point where you faced a challenge, stop, and uh, maybe we can talk through what the problems potentially were. Uh, so let me just start from scratch. And uh, you know, part of the challenge here is figuring out where the watershed is. And so um, I don't want to minimize that. But if you go to Ona, West Virginia, then the, uh, here's that odd-shaped road that's so distinctive. And here is our creek. And so um, you know, I have the latitude and longitude of it on the paper that I gave you. But um, we can double check our watershed outlet using these latitude and longitude indicators down here. So I'm going to begin just by uh, starting up the project. And um, I'll save this in a different folder just so that I don't pollute my other folder with uh, WMS quiz demo. I'm not going to go through the super slow, but um, please do let me know if you got hung up on a certain part and you need a more in-depth explanation. So I'm double checking that I'm set to zone 17. I want to make sure that my vertical units are in meters, because if they're not, everything's going to be thrown off. I uh, also need to make sure that here in the projection that, um, that the units are in meters, the horizontal units as well. The planar units are set to meters, so they are. All right, I'll define the boundary. Uh, now, this is no fair, because I'm already zoomed in on it. But if I just go own a West Virginia and jump to the location, it takes me to the bustling downtown metroplex area. And I look for that shape. There we go, Big Cabell Creek Road. And you can kind of make out uh, the shape of that watershed. What we're looking for is this leg. And so the distinctive clue is if you look on the image that I gave you, look at this downward bend of the stream. And so that same downward bend is here. Here is that. And so I want to make sure that I have the whole ridge line. Once you get in the habit of seeing these watershed boundaries on the topo map, you can kind of get there. All right, so then I'll just use the web services for my data. And I'm going to turn on three things. I'm going to have the elevation data, national land cover database, because I'm going to need fat for the curve number, and also the Sergo soil. So download data, and it'll ask me which resolution for the elevation data. I'll just use this default uh, 7 and a half meter resolution. It'll ask again, once it downloads, it'll ask again for the uh, national land cover database. If I wanted to resample for that, I'll just take the base. Now it's getting the. Um, the vector soil type data. 
All right, so it's all there. Now, straight away, I can see that one of these soil, I don't need this whole, it's maybe Mason County or something, I don't need it. I'm just going to take the, uh, this one is what I need. So eliminate this from the project, and that'll speed things up. I'll turn this off for now. I'm going to zoom in on here. I need to do, uh, I'll turn off also the elevation demo and the uh, land cover database. So now, of course, we have to go back to the wizard. Well, we don't have to do it through the wizard, but calculate topaz. And you're not going to see any streams if this is set too high. 200 would be all right, but let me just set it to 20 acres and compute topaz. And uh, so there's that stream that I'm trying to uh, delineate. So next will get me the outlet that I'm going to drop. Now, your area is going to be slightly different depending on where you drop that outlet. And you can use these latitude longitude coordinates as an indicator. So you can line it up roughly in the right spot. And then uh, next, delineate the watershed. Now this area is probably going to be slightly different than the one I got before, 293 acres. I think that's about what I had in the first time that I delineated it, uh, 296. So I must have clicked a little bit further to the left this time. All right, um, now we're going to do three different models. Oh, wait, hold on. Uh, I need to zoom out again. So we have to trash this whole thing. I need to... Uh, Get these bounds. So I need to pan. Yeah, that'd be great. Eyes getting sloppy. All right, we'll do it again. It won't take long. All right, so turning off the one that I don't need. Run Topaz again. Hopefully we got it this time. We will uh, drop the outlet here and delineate. All right, didn't change much, 296 acres. All right, so national stream flow statistics I can get straight away. Uh, all you need for that is the area. So here in the drop down box, I'm going to switch it to NSS, double click on that kind of hidden icon that's behind all these tags. And the area is known. I need to switch it from Alabama to West Virginia, and then scroll down West Virginia. Uh, the, the most recent data is the 2010 models, and remember it carves the state up into three sections, the Central Mountains, the Eastern Panhandle, and we're not either of those, so we must by default be the Western Plateaus, and we're in the far western part of the state, so it makes sense. So you add it over here to the selected equations, uh, and then compute results, and uh, it's telling us that the... Hmm, The 10-year, 24 CFS. I somehow I doubt that. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I must have when I started over. My uh, units maybe are off. So 296 acres. Hmm. Let's see here. Back to West Virginia. Okay, the area seems right here. Point four square miles, West Virginia, Western Plateau, compute results. There we go. 170 CFS, 10 years. I think uh, I accidentally clicked this button before I did compute results, and I think that must have reset the areas. All right, so 170 CFS. That's what I got the first time around. All right, so we're done with that. Now to do the TR55, we have to calculate the curve numbers. 
And so I'm going to need to create a uh, coverage, a soil type coverage. So if you didn't do that, remember the way to do it is you right click on the word coverage, new coverage, and soil type. And that is where I'm going to paste in the relevant polygons here that have the soil data that I need. So let me go into the uh, select the shapes that encompass my entire watershed. Okay, I've got those soil type polygons selected. I need to right click, join in our CS data, and I'm just going to fill any blank values with type B. And you see it's joining the hydrologic soil group. If I didn't do this step, then these polygons don't have the hydrologic soil group data. So remember, the way to do that is you right click on the GIS data, join in our CS. All right, fill the blanks with B. I don't think there are any blanks, but just to be sure, we'll do it that way. So all these are selected. Now I do shapes to feature objects. So it's taking this shape data and it's turning them into soil type feature objects. And that is where we need to make sure that the hydrologic soil group is getting mass, uh, mapped on the SES soil type. And we see all of the different soil types that are in our uh, highlighted polygons. And so now all of those are going to be copied over to the soil type coverage. I can turn off the soil type GIS data, and there they are in the coverage. So if I flip it on and off, it's there. The grid is already there. If I turn on the grid, you'll see that we've got the land use data. So with that, I can now calculate the curve numbers here in the calculators tab. And to get the calculators tab, you have to be in the hydrologic modeling module. So calculators, compute GIS attributes, and I'm going to import that table, the uh, curve number table that we had before. Mm, it's in one of these subfolders, I think. There it is, curve table. And it's going to use the grid for the land use. So that grid it's talking about is the land use grid. It doesn't need to be turned on visually for it to be able to access it. The soil type it's going to get from the soil type coverage. And after it calculates, it brings up the results of the calculations in the uh, notepad. Now, this is a pretty unique watershed. Just by coincidence, it has quite a lot of type B soils. And so it has a much lower curve number than most of the other watersheds I've worked with in the state. So we're going to see that when we calculate the TR55 and HEC1, the peak flows are going to be quite a bit less than what NSS predicts, because NSS uses the entire state characteristics to come up with like an empirical equation to predict runoff. So this is a pretty low curve number. And now that I've got it, I can close that and switch into TR55. And so we need to calculate the time of concentration using the basin data. So you click Compute, and we'll select the lag time method of SCS. And it fills in the time of concentration. <coughs> Excuse me. We also need to get the uh, rainfall data. So we go to the precipitation data frequency server. This is the one external website that we're going to have to use in this case, because for whatever reason, it'll go get it dynamically in HEC1, but it won't do it for TR55. So we drop the crosshairs approximately where we're at and go down here. And we need to get the 10-year, 24-hour storm depth. So 10-year, 24-hour, 3.61 inches. So that is what I'm going to put here under the rainfall, 3.61 inches. And it's type 2 is the precipitation pattern that we have across the state. And you notice that it's calculated the peak discharge is 72.7 CFS. So that compares favorably to, I found before, 74 CFS. So. Mm. Oh, yeah, you could be right. Let's see here. Um, in inches. Yeah. But I'm glad you brought that up, because that is something you want, you want to make sure that you're on depth and not on intensity. 
because if I guess I didn't even consider it because 3.61 seems reasonable to me but if I had it on intensity I'd like to think that if it said 0.15 I'd say that doesn't sound like a 10-year storm depth I didn't to be honest with you I didn't check this but I think I kind of just uh, um, not implied inferred from the uh, the depth that this was right so 3.61 um, all right, so 73, 74 CFS is the TR55, yeah. Thirty CFS? It's possible. I mean, there could be cumulative, like if you drop the crosshairs in slightly a different spot, and if you delineated the watershed like right here, right before it joins the mainstream, and so now you've got a larger area. Um, it's possible. I'll have to take a look. Yeah, it, it's more than I'd expect, but I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. I got a curve number closer to like 70. Really? I chose bigger, like I, I highlighted more, I guess. Would that cause that difference? Hmm, that's... Like make sure I only highlight... No. No, uh, you know, if anything, you did the right thing because it might have, uh, you know, when it fills in missing values with type B, it could have done that. So that's an interesting question. Let's give it a shot. If we uh, recalculate, so here's my soil data. Well, I've got a lot of that. You know, this is what got copied over. So I wouldn't expect that there's any empty polygons in there, but maybe. Let's just do it again. I'm going to zoom way out. Okay, so let me reselect. all of that and copy that uh, join NRCS data and you know what? I'm not going to fill the blank values just to see if it gives me any but I'm joining I'll paste it uh, again over into I'm not sure if I have to delete that or if it will overwrite let me delete it and then I'll create a new one Okay, so we've got a new coverage. Um, I'm going to copy it over. All right, and then. Um, Calculate. Interesting. Yeah, so now it's saying 62. So I think it might be the case that there were some polygons that it was assigning that B if I wasn't uh, zoomed out far enough. And I, boy, I'd like to think that if I zoom out farther, it's not going to change it anymore. But you're saying you got. 70? Uh huh. D. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. So you filled blank values with D. Yeah, so I just now told it not to fill any blank values, and so it's calculating it only on the basis of the polygons that it has information for. So um, this, you know, I don't often see watersheds that have any blank soil values, and so. That's an interesting thing. I'm going to have to look at it more closely and try and nail down like where in our watershed is it that it's not having the soil data. But just to avoid any uncertainty, um, I think what, what I'd suggest like as a rule of thumb, do this on the exam, is uh, zoom out so that you have, you know, the entire watershed is definitely covered and maybe the entire watershed width on either side like this. And then I'll tell you in the exam what to fill the blank values with. I mean, in a professional environment, you're going to hopefully know the area well enough that you can say, well, I want to be conservative, so I'm going to fill it with D. Or there really is a lot of type B soil in this area, so I'm going to have it go with B. But I'll tell you what to fill the blank values with when I give you a similar problem on the exam. All right, so we have uh, a curve number. And... Um, We've done the NSS, we've done the TR55, let's just finally do the HEC1. So um, let me turn this 
off so that we're not seeing it. All right, so when you bring up the HEC1 parameters, you need to make sure that the precipitation is set. So the simplest way to do that is with base and average, and then it knows the location. So all you, can, all you need to do is click Get Precipitation, and it'll, based on the latitude and longitude, it'll pull the same precipitation data frequency, uh, frequency server data that we got, change it to the 10-year get the data, so it's saying 3.6, which is about what we had gotten when we did 3.61 when we did it manually. So that's good. Now, okay, so it fills it in. Define series, we need to set it to type 2, 24 hour. That's the standard rainfall temporal distribution for this area. Okay, so the precipitation is set. The loss method, we make sure that it's copied over the curve number that's been calculated. Unit hydrograph method, um, loss method, just the default. It, since it sees curve numbers, it knows to use the uh, SCS curve, no, curve number method. So what we all we do is we look and see that these curve numbers match um, what we'd previously calculated. How did you do that, uh, that curve? In precipitation, define series. So uh, if you have the edit HEC1 parameters, click precipitation. After base and average is selected, then it'll bring that option available. And which one did you pick? Uh, Type 2, 24 hour. And so then what it does from that is it knows the depth, and this is it's when it's sprinkling that how much of the rainfall at what time. You got it? All right. So type 2, 24-hour storm. Um, unit hydrograph method, it should remember from before when we calculated this with the TR-55, but just double check with the uh, basin data that it's set to lag time SCS method. I mean, unless you're in a watershed where you have a specific reason to use some other approach. But then you see it's, it's already used the watershed length, the curve number, the slope. All right. And uh, so that's set. And you can just run the model now. Now, when we did this before, I suggested that if you wanted to see the entire hydrograph, that you should open up the job control and add additional hydrograph ordinates more than 150, but 150 will show you the peak, so I'm not going to bother changing that. I'm just going to run the simulation and making sure that the uh, file that it's writing to isn't buried in a bunch of subfolders because that's something that can cause uh, the computation engine some trouble. It's not good at looking in subfolders. So we run it, it has a normal end, and then the hydrograph it brings up hasn't tapered all the way to zero, but it does show me the peak. And so now it's saying 92 CFS. Um, when I ran this before and I had the lower curve number because it was overriding the empty values with soil class B, uh, that was bringing the curve number fairly low, and so I had 65 CFS. But now um, it didn't write group B in any of the missing polygons. It just calculated the curve number on the basis of the data that it does have. And so 90 CFS. And again, why is that so low compared to the National Streamflow Statistics? Well, think about the National Streamflow Statistics. All it has going into it is the uh, area. It's a one-parameter regression model. It doesn't know anything about the basin slope. It doesn't know anything about the, uh, uh, the soil type or the land use. It's only intended to be applied in rural areas, and so it shouldn't be applied in areas that are heavily urbanized because things will be totally different there. But um, if you want to go through the workflow of this or watch it again, the first part of the recording for today's lecture is like 11 or 12 minutes long, and I went through the entire thing in about 11 or 12 minutes uh, without the commentary that I gave you later. But um, this is something that you should be prepared to do like I said before, in, a, in about 25 or 30 minutes for the final exam, you know, there will be approximately four 
questions on the final exam, like four lengthy questions. And so like if I had uh, maybe a shorter one, then that would give me some more time to ask you conceptual questions. But I mean, a question like this will be about a quarter of the exam, is how I'd like to put it. It'll be about uh, a third of the points, maybe 30% of the points will be conceptual on the final. So it will be similar to the format of the first two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that on the second part of the exam, you can use like uh, other resources. Okay, well, hopefully, even if you didn't submit your work, hopefully it was a, a useful experience to cement in that process again. If you consistently get hung up on a certain thing, even after going through the video, you can't make it work, please let me know because, you know, like this curve number thing that we discovered today, there's always uh, little tweaks that, you know, I may not be aware of and would like to learn. So let me know if you notice something funny. Have a good one. I'll see you Thursday.